Thanks. Okay. One of the things we've talked about is, is how do we understand value with respect to or, uh, open source within an organization? And I've come up, this is a set of questions that I would be actually quite happy to do a series of interviews uh, with different organizations to try to understand how they understand value with respect to, to open source. And honestly, the agenda item is just, if you have feedback on these questions, or thoughts on them, or you don't like them, or you would like to add another one, um, that would be really helpful to me. And the intention would be is that I would reach out to a, a kind of a variety of organizations and run these as interviews, um, and then kind of bring the themes back to people that comes from the answers. So that's it. So I give you a second to read them if you'd like. Think of it as if I called you <laughs> and asked you these questions. I think I was initially confused when you said the project because I was thinking an open source project. So when you said join a project, I was a bit confused. No problem. Yeah. Oh yeah, I see that, yeah. Is, is this something that, um, I don't know, a lot of these questions read like something I might get on a survey from like the LF. And so I was trying to think of, is this something we could federate through a larger organization? Um, we could, I, um... but then it doesn't relate directly to like it's directly pertinent to chaos. Yeah, and I would I would really like to do these as interviews, hmm. just because usually the conversation is just really deep and really thoughtful. But instead of that, this particular data symbol, and we could have a hat string for this. Uh, so it would be a number. I, I do have a similar reaction to that is that I've seen some data around these kinds of questions, not these specific questions. Uh, but I think a, a serve like a interview makes sense for this approach, but it might still be helpful to collect what we've already seen from other surveys just so that that can help you either test, confirm, or yeah. push back on these ideas. I think yeah. surveys are pretty limited in format. So I know I think to Gary's point, I think I have seen some things out of the LF. I know I have some too. Um, so I can help try to find what they're, I, like trying to remember where I saw all the things. Um, and I also feel like the to-do survey has yeah, some of this in it so too. Yeah, I was just gonna say the to-do survey because I do think that that one has a lot of similar questions to this. Great, super. Smart, is this foundation or is this project? That was a question I still have. Where at? Where are you at? Is it in general? Is this about uh, participating in a foundation? No, it's intended like you're participating in or with an open source project. Like you contributing to it or things like yeah, that? Yeah, exactly. Yep. Okay. You know, we were talking about um, the arc of like consumption, participation, con contribution, and leadership. And you start off with your first question with like participate. I wonder if we, we need to just understand what people mean when they say participate. Like, what does it mean? It, like, does simply the use of open source mean you're participating in an open source project or are we talking about real like um, contributions and, and leadership? Yeah, my, my thought was not just uh, use, but more like engagement and control and influence. <laughs> yeah, so maybe because you the very first question that you have, yeah, and this probably not, yeah, yep. starts and with this, the, is this is this um, specific to a single project? Like, are you doing research on a single project and asking questions about value? No, it wouldn't be like um, it would be any project that uh, an interview we wanted to identify. Okay. So they would speak to a particular example that they could speak to. Okay. 
but you're going to ask them like the same questions about one particular project. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yep. Got it. Would it make sense then to add a question initially that's how do you participate in blank project to clarify whether or not you're a contributor, whether you're simply consuming the project, or right. if you uh, your organization has plans to get involved with some sort of leadership down the road? Yep. Like this. that and then like kind of defining more like code. Um, are you considering the range of participation opportunities which could be bug reports feature requests writing code providing infrastructure which is what I primarily do writing documentation like there's a there's a broad variety of contributions that yep. aren't necessarily reflected in git commits yep that's fair um how do you, i could how do you do you think that would help kind of understand like yeah, i probably would like understand how they're deriving value particularly if they're making um say code contributions versus event contributions versus some other type of contribution is that what your thought is here yeah i'm just trying to capture the range of value added um specifically um i want to capture the range the to, to, to enumerate perhaps and like explore the range of non-code contributions to projects which can be substantial and critical to success like probably every project would be improved by um, assigning a documentation writer to it 10 hours a week. <laughs> Everything would be better. In that, in that. My life would be better. <laughs> Everyone would be happy. Like, this deliriously is happy. Well, this is great. All right. And I think these questions too, like kind of defining how you participate and maybe um, the types of contributions that are being made, I don't think they add a lot to the interview. You know what I mean? So I, right. without worrying about length too much. So that's good. Thank you. Since these are interviews, could you maybe even ask just an open-ended question like, what does value mean to you? Or how do you? I could. I was hmm. going to plus one that because I also think there's how they're thinking about value can help you understand how they're thinking about metrics uh as well as is it organizational value team value individual value like i don't know how they're quantifying that and how they're breaking that up if you think about something like justification there's often the aggregate justification of why we're doing this but also the individual justification of why they're spending time on this and specific types of activities which kind of goes back to the contribution or participation style um, in terms of how you are participating could also cover how you justify participating and associate value with that participation mm -hmm. so i think Again, like it's really easy to make these longer, but I think I would I would be really interested in that aspect. And I think especially those different levels of say impact value and justification. Okay. Or depending on what you're trying to get out of the survey, you might need to define value, what what you mean by value. Because I think different organizations are going to look at that differently. Some might immediately go to like, you know, what's the financial value to my company? Some might think more about, you know, other other types of value. Is there a particular type of value that should be at the focus here? That people think. So this is it. Yeah, I mean, I think. Oh, sorry. Go. Ahead. I, I just uh, you're next, Melissa. I'll, I'll say that any kind of successful project that I've ever been in has had multiple benefits across a broad range of stuff and. If you financialize it too much and focus on one number, you lose a bunch of things. And if you okay. just look at goodwill, you lose a bunch of things. It has to be a portfolio of results. Okay. Alyssa, you had something to say too? Yeah, I agree with that. And I would I would also just say, like, since this is an OSPO um, chaos met like working group, I do think like business value is sort of the like wh why. however we frame business value, I feel like that's something that we're all responsible for yeah the 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 um the kind of the premise of this at least you know 
um, in prior meetings was uh, kind of aligning OSPO functions with with business value. That was kind of how I had always understood it. But through this discussion, I understand that that value could be placed other places as well. And I, it's I also can... like a trigger word, a not trigger word, but like it is like common language, right? I think business value is something that you, I feel like, hear a lot as an OSPO. Okay. People, yeah, people, for me, like, I'm not talking about community value as much as business value. Okay. That was, yeah, that was kind of where my mind was as well. I like a what's in it for us, but also realizing that the community has to function correctly for us to get any value out of it. Like a primary focus is there needs to be a business value for your organization or why are you doing this? Mm-hmm. And why you, you being the OSPO? Why you being the OSPO or you being an individual contributor? Okay, okay. Which okay. might be different questions, right? Like, why are you doing it? Well, I wanna advance my career. And also it lines up with a project that I need to deliver for my boss. Like both of those are valid, but people have individual motivations as well yep. as business, business stuff. Okay. This is helpful. Thank you. Um, I may, as I continue to refine these based on this discussion, I might reach out to just a few of you to do a practice to walk through it. And you can, it's usually kind of helpful because sometimes questions can kind of get in the way of each other, or one question will actually, um, an early question can actually answer a later question. You know what I mean? The, the answers kind of somehow feed into that and I can remove questions sometimes. So if it's okay, I might reach out to a few of you just to just to see the mechanics of how this works. Great, thank you. Um, have you thought though about all the NDAs you have to sign? For, or... Wait, what have I thought about what? I mean, to do these interviews, like, well, it, it, yeah, there, pro there probably will have to be like some NDA signed or my, oh, my... yeah, yeah, yeah. So okay. I, I mean, technically, so as a, just mechanically as a professor, I have to, I would take this and I would actually put it through um, an IRB approval process. So I have to have this uh, interview list kind of approved and as part of that, uh, there's a um, a letter that I send out ahead of the interview that kind of explains all of the things that I think you're talking about, Alyssa, which would be like, you know, you're allowed to end the interview at any time, you're allowed to retract everything you say at any time, <laughs> you're just, um, and typically as part of the process, I would provide a transcript back to the person who was interviewed and give them an opportunity to just either confirm, you know, approve it or not. And I also give a, a several days after I do the interview. Um, and I'm, I always say to people, if you said anything and you sleep on it that night and you're like, I probably shouldn't have said that you can, there's always an opportunity to, to, to remove questions. So not a problem there. And then I anonymize everything before sharing it. Does that help? Yeah, I think, um, yeah, this sounds exciting. I would love to be a fly on the wall for these conversations. Also, I'd love to ask um, other people in my organization these same, same questions. I'm sure you would hear something different about what value is from the same quote, OSPO. Well, that's that's great because we'll, the hope is, is that we get a variety of themes that would come out of this, that it's not mm -hmm. just unified answer <laughs> that everybody... You know, and then we can kind of present what those those different value propositions are. And I think the hope from the earlier discussions was that um, this could provide nice narrative for folks, for example, who are on this call to talk about the alignment between OSPOs and, and business value, or we talked about alignment with um, strategy as well, business strategy. Um, so that's the intention here is to provide support for that conversation for you all. Yeah, I so, think that, that's super good because as you can think of it, even when you ask these questions, they could kind of like um, cause people to think, yeah, what do I 
value and do, we, do I actually have numbers for it? And asking those questions to different levels of management could be a little bit eye-opening to, to see how far the gaps in understanding of value are. Excellent. Do you think that's captured here, Christine? Or do you think there's a, I hope it is. I have to kind of like read it again, but I was kind of looking for like, is there like my understanding of value versus your understanding of value? Sure. That would be interesting. I'm not sure if it's captured here or it's going to be like a byproduct of analyzing. Okay. Yeah. Um, and if yeah, it would things. be really interesting to see if um, if the concept of value was different when you're talking to more junior people, when you're talking to kind of mid-level people, when you're talking to executives, depending mm -hmm. on their their particular role, I'd be curious how yes. the how the data shakes out. Yes. And also, I would like even in terms of function, like the legal person as opposed to the comms person, as opposed to like the technical, like resources, et cetera, et cetera. Can so, I ask, yeah, go ahead. There, there's just also the like, while we're in the middle of business speak, um, we're talking a lot about value, but I feel like the other word people like to throw around a lot of impact. And I don't know if you're, again, like in terms of how people are defining value that might imply how they're defining impact, but we can't necessarily assume that. Um, that could also totally blow up your interview and be an entire conversation around how you define value and then equate that to impact and quantifiable impact to your organization. So I'll let you decide whether or not you have space for that in there. I just wanted to throw it out that I think you're either going to have to bring people back to talking about only value or plan to separate out the value and impact conversations. I don't, I don't quite know how you would do that. I just, I see that as a potential ambiguous area, especially when you start talking about justification and valuation as implied to outcome in business land. So do you think there's there are questions of impact in here at the moment? It's implied, but not said. That's how I how I read it, which is why the conversation could go there. Gotcha. But you might depending on what you're trying to like if you're just focusing on value, then I would try to keep that that focus because I think it's gotcha. It can it can be stretched in many ways. Okay. I gotcha. Um, I'll, I wrote that down. I'll keep an eye on that and particularly on maybe some of the like pilot interviews, some of those preliminary interviews, I could see if that really seems to create a problem, this confound between the two. Okay. Um, and then I was the point above it, um, interviews can be a little bit harder to ask demographic information sometimes. So I, but I can, I, I think to your point, I think Don, you had raised it. I, I certainly can ask um, the role people have in their company. That seems very reasonable um, as well as how long they have been working in open source would probably be the other, the other question. Can I ask why it's more difficult? Like, I just, um, it, it just ends up taking a lot of time mm. trying to get to the, to the questions that you see here. And it's, it's um, um, surveys on demographic information seem to be a little bit better of a self-report. And those are often questions I just don't ask mm. in an interview. You could probably ask it on the form, on your IRB, like the form that you send out. I could. You could add a field for title and just try to get a, a sense for for yeah. their, their yep. title yep i could definitely do that and it was christine that brought it up it wasn't me oh, i just I seconded plus one her <laughs> her idea awesome thank you christine can i ask again because i came late um what which institution this is part of and actually your name because it just reads as chaos community oh hey, look at that <laughs> I'll put my name in. I'm Matt German Bray, and I'm a professor at the University of Nebraska Omaha, and one of the founders of the Chaos Project. And so, right. yep, whole whole university process that I have to follow with respect to anonymity and disclosure and all that kind of stuff. And, and Matt, I might have missed this as well, but and wh where would some of these findings go? Like, are they for? If, yeah, what's that? What's the purpose? 
honestly, the primary purpose is to bring it back to this group. Full stop. Aww. If we if we can, I mean, if the hope I suppose is if we can have some interesting findings to bring it forward in OSS EU or OSS NA, whether or not I have an uh, OSS Japan or Japan, <laughs> can do that too, wherever it might be. So I mean, I the the intention here is to really have this focused on um, the practice side of things, you know, the organizational side of things. So I, my intention was not to to um, write an academic paper out of this, although that's something that could happen if somebody had an interest, but that was not my my intention. And are there students working on this as well? Uh, no, it's just me at the moment. Shoot. Yep. I've run, I've done maybe a thousand <laughs> interviews in my life. So this is a, an approach that I really enjoy doing just because you, you get to meet really great people. And like interview answers are so, they have so much depth to them, but there are a lot of things that get revealed that I think surveys don't always see. Right. And how long are these interviews? There's like 10 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour? Uh, they're usually about 45 minutes to an hour is what I like to keep them at. <laughs> it does depend on how, some people are more chatty and some people are less chatty. So, <laughs> you know. Do you want to interview all my all, all the relevant coworkers that I have and give me back a readout on the results? Because I could really use some of these answers. <laughs> Can't do that. <laughs> we, we could make arrangements, yeah. <laughs> this is very helpful. Thank you. I have these resources too, but thank you for that as well. Um, and thank you for the feedback on the questions. And if you're if you walk away from these and you're like, you know what else would be a really cool question, don't hesitate to just add it to this and I'll I'll try to work it in. Okay. Any final questions, comments for from Matt or for Matt? No, but I, I like this. I this is, you know, it's funny that we've come here to like, I mean, like I feel like we've gone a circle in these meetings and to come to this interview question. So I think it's um uh, yeah. this, uh, I, I like where where this these questions have come from awesome thank you Alyssa okay um Elizabeth do you want to talk about this next one the update to chaos weekly and the move to chaos monthly sure uh it's just what it says <laughs> so we uh, we do have a weekly newsletter that we send out we're switching it to a monthly format that will be a little bit uh, lighter weight for yours truly. And I will still continue to summarize these meetings. I, I usually put just a high level summary of what we talked about in our Slack channel and with a link to the minutes and a link to the recording just for anybody who has missed it or wants to go back and remember the good old days of when we talked about a certain subject or not. So um, yeah, that's about it. I am curious via the... Uh, uh... Zoom emojis. How many of you read the Chaos Weekly every week? <laughs> yeah, nobody reads it. That's another, <laughs> that's another reason why I'm like, yeah, you know, I don't know. We've been doing it the same way for years, for literally years. So yeah, we're just yeah. going to shake we it up. Also, we also talked about maybe making the format a little shorter and easier to uh, easier for people to consume. Um, and maybe if it's monthly, people will read it more often. Awesome. Okay, cool. Thanks, Elizabeth. Um, is there anything uh, we've we've actually reached the end of our agenda? Is there anything else anyone would like to talk about? Any any topics that we need to discuss? I raise my hand. Yeah, go ahead. I, um, I am faced with the task of evaluating dozens of open source projects for health. And I am I know that this is like health or quality or like some sort of measure, qualitative measure of things. I know that's something that this group has chewed on a couple of times. Um, I know that it's a fruitful area for years of research, but also I would love it if there's a short answer for like what can you what can you point at something and get back a number 
I hate to reduce it to that, but like, are, are there commonly shared, commonly understood things, or is this still such an area of open research that it's hard to, hard to give a, 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 a short answer? You already have implemented any of the, the chaos tools like Grimmer Lab, Baturgia, or, or Augur? Like, do you already have the data somewhere, or is this your, your, this is where you're starting? Um, I've seen Baturgia at a demo sort of level. Mm -hmm. um, we're working with the folks at, uh, what's it called? Awesome. No, this is a this is a queer, this is a tool that provides a SQL query language on top of Git, and then has a reporting engine to give you interesting reports out of a repository based mm -hmm. on the on, on a query language and a reporting language. Um, oh, what's it called? I, I'll I'll dig it up before the end of the, the, the before before the end of the call if I can. But in any case, I have not done the search for tools yet with the thought that I need to use them right away and I'm getting closer to the point of needing to use them right away. You mentioned a couple names I'd love to take. You mentioned Baturgia, which I was well familiar with. What's the what's the rest of that list that's like things similar to that? Yeah, so the, the chaos community itself has um, several tools. I'm just gonna drop some in here. Yeah, Gr Grimoire Lab is one of them. Augur is another one of them. Um, things you can set up for yourself on prem and configure to like monitor things you want to monitor and okay. even create dashboards and stuff that uh, you want to do. I, I was gonna jump in and say, ha ha ha, there's this viability thing that I've been working on that um, does have components that specifically look at community. It is a aggregation of metrics that chaos has defined and that can be traced in those same dashboards. Uh, if you had asked me this in a couple of weeks or maybe a month when I have an instance of it running, I, I would have been very happy to paste a, a screenshot or something, but I don't have it working in such a state that I'm happy to share it right at this point. Sure. Um, but but I, I would plug that uh, many things are batteries included. Uh, in Grimoire Lab in terms of those metrics. Okay, I, I have this, I see the spelling of it from Matt. Thanks, Matt. Yeah, so, you know, it kind of depends on, this is, so, so I'm just kicking off a, a data science initiative um, and a data science working group within, within the chaos project and the data science working group um, just FYI is going to meet every other Wednesday starting next Wednesday at, I think this time, it's on the chaos calendar. So people are interested in joining us, um, just a quick plug for that. Um, but as, as part of that work, I've been um, doing some, some work to try to position the, the software that we have within the chaos project to help people understand kind of which one they might want to pick depending on, on what they're, what they're trying to do. Um, so I would say, you know, maybe maybe have a look at a couple of these and see if one sort of resonates with your, with your approach. You know, we've seen that, um, you know, Grimoire Lab has, which is the platform that Baturgy has built on, they have loads of data sources. So you can pull in Slack and wikis and, you know, issue trackers and all kinds of things um, beyond like GitHub and, and GitLab. Um, Augur, on the other hand, uh, the other tool uh, is mostly based on kind of uh, like GitHub, GitLab data, but it scales to like 100,000 repositories. So if you're looking at a massive amount of data, Augur's a pretty good, pretty good choice. Mm -hmm. um, Grimoire Lab is really, uh, really great at easy visualization. So you can get a real snapshot of the health of your community by just looking at the dashboards that the Grimoire Lab comes with. Um, on the other hand, Augur, if you have like a lot of really detailed custom questions, like kind of from a data science or research-based approach, um, the Augur's Postgres database is really good at, at letting you get at kind of obscure questions that you can't really anticipate. So that's kind of like the, the differences between the two. They're, they, you know, they're kind of the same. They, at the end of the day, they get you kind of the same thing, but in very, very different ways and very different 
methods of, of getting there. Um, and, you know, we'd be happy to, to chat more about that if you're, if you're interested. Did that help? Does that give you some? That, that does help. Yeah. Just, uh, just getting, uh, I mean, uh, getting anchored with a couple examples so that I can run a sample report somewhere, which I'm capable of doing, sounds mm -hmm. like would be a good start. And then you'd say, oh, this looks nice, but I wish I could do X. And at least I can start from a, well, I know how to do something uh, perspective. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Don. Yeah, cool. If you have any more questions, post them in, in the Slack channel and we'd be happy yep. to, to answer them if you run into any issues. Any other questions, topics, topics for discussion? Um, I had a, just wondering what this group thought about like the, the maintainer survey that came out or paper that came out from Linux Foundation. Um, I just put a link to it, to it. What's this open source maintainers? I am on page 21, so I have not oh, good. Tell us finished on. it um, because I was I was actually just reading it this afternoon over lunch. Um, so far, I've I found it to be really good. Like it it uh, it sort of resonates with all of the things that I think maintainers go through based on based on my experience. Um, so I I don't know. From my perspective, it seemed it seemed pretty interesting, and it it seemed to resonate with with what what I believe to be true based on my own experience. I'm curious what others think. Yeah, me too. And 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 I just wanted to bring up that this one statistic in particular that they said 62% of interviewees are employed to work full time on their projects. I, I was just people. Yeah. I, I was wondering what people thought about that sample. I think it's high, but it also mirrors what's happening in the Linux kernel right now. At least according to another piece of research that came out recently. But it's not it's not based on the kernel. It's a whole bunch of things. So they interviewed maintainers from like Salt and Curl and a whole bunch of different projects. But that's interesting, Sophia, because my gut would say that it's probably if you're talking about maintainers, that that number felt low to me, not high. <laughs> But I work mostly in the CNCF ecosystem, so I, I have I have biases for sure. Yeah, maybe that's why I was thinking like I'm trying to counter that bias because I think I'm more aware of projects that have more paid work in them because as a company we're close we're more involved in those things by default because we have people employed on them. But also because of the way that they were recruiting individuals from very popular packages based on the criticality score or the census report. Um, I, to me, that also biases it toward things that are getting more attention, which tend to have more paid maintainers in it is kind of how I would interpret that versus it being more representative of all projects. Um, so I know maybe that's like, it, it could be its own self-selecting bias, but the 60 something percent mirrors the Linux kernel research that also came out recently. Um, and that was a subset of Linux kernel folks took a survey of like 20, 200 and something people um, and about 60 something percent of them were paid to work full time in the Linux kernel. So I feel like that number, I, I like when they start hearing ratios like that come out in other places, because to me that grocks a little bit more with this kind of maybe category of critical infrastructure projects as defined by use by lots of companies. Do you have um uh that Linux kernel like um link too? Because that uh, the interpretation here was that that number was very high, and that sure. um, it, it, yeah. it was like it was a reason to like not listen to the rest of the. the <laughs> yeah. Well, oh. I have to warn you that piece of research was on a completely different topic. It just part of it sent out a survey to Linux kernel participants, um, and contributors. So. Hold on, let me paste that in. Any other thoughts on that, that report? It's an interesting read. I would encourage people who work in OSPOS to have a look at it because I do think it it sheds some interesting light on some of the challenges that individual maintainers have, and some of the um, some of the techniques that they talk about working for them to get around some of the challenges around, like you know, building a good contributor base and things like that. So I, I would encourage people to read it. 
says the person who's only on page 21, but I think I'm almost done with it. <laughs> I skipped forward to page 21 and 22 and it talks about documentation, so. Yeah, that's the part I haven't read yet. That's, that's, that's where I'm going. It's a, it, it's a good read. Yeah, it's a good read. It's uh, most projects are painfully lacking in resources for documentation and the, the, um, the trade-off is do you merge new code or do you overhaul the documentation? And that's a, if it's one person doing both of those jobs, that's a real trade-off. Yeah, for sure. Okay, so we have, we have 10 minutes left. Are there any other things that people wanted to chat about while we have everybody here? I just got lost down a train of thought based on that last conversation where there's a lot of discussion right now of the impact of paying maintainers. And what if instead of paying more maintainers, we pay technical writers <laughs> in support of maintainers, like understanding that that would take off a lot of burden of the maintainer and improve the overall posture of the project if they just have more support and documentation. And sort of looking at the impact of say, instead of hiring more maintainers, hiring technical writers to support them but that's a wild idea and not really a discussion. <laughs> it's just kind of like, what if we did this instead? Could we justify that with data? And maybe this report can help with that. Yeah. Just don't hire away my technical writer. I'll be... <laughs> no, that's really interesting. It's actually, it's actually one of the things that I encourage maintainers to think about um, when they're trying to grow their community is to really think about um, getting people into some of these not code positions like documentation, community management. Like I try to encourage maintainers to think about how much of their time they could free up if they got some other people who have some other skills who could do some of the things that they're, I mean, let's face it, they're probably not particularly efficient at managing the community or writing documentation if their primary skill set has been has been writing code. I also encourage them to think of it as a leadership position where they actually need to manage a bunch of stuff and they don't always like that. There, I'm supporting a project right now that's starting to look at that, um, more looking at trying to quantify this work versus measuring, because you have to quantify it before you can measure the impact of it. But I've had very similar conversations with folks, Don, about how instead of like bringing more people in, if we could basically carve out stuff that you anyone else can do and not just the maintainer to give the maintainer back more time to do just that work and trying to help them isolate or carve out tasks that can be taken by other individuals with less context, less background, less technical need, like, because there's so many other things that could be done and maintainers tend to do all of it. And so what if we were able to separate the tasks a bit better? Mm -hmm. um, and just like, I think looking at that and the impact of bringing on that other work support um, versus just say, more maintainers. Totally. Tabitha, you unmuted. Yes. So this is something that we recently started doing uh, using some um, MLH fellows, uh, to uh, DevRel uh, uh, MLH fellows, to sort of evaluate and help us improve the documentation for our, our portfolio of projects that we support internally. And it's and it's worked out pretty well, though there is some initial resistance to uh, writing documentation, right? Like it always is. Uh, but because there, there is that level of uplift that has to happen and education that has to happen for them to be involved in the code base at any level, that this uh, gives them an opportunity to get familiarized. And I encourage them to take notes as they are to turn that in and like stumbling blocks, use this for documentation. This is all good fodder as you're, as you're evaluating the code and getting familiar with it, to start writing up those questions that you encountered, of the answers to those questions. Seems to be going well. I don't know how sustainable it is, you know, over a long term, but, um, you know, it's a start. <laughs> and it takes some of that pressure off of, uh, off of the core maintainers of the project to get that done too. Cool, thanks. What, what I sometimes see with maintainers, especially those who kind of like think the project is their baby, is they just very much don't want to give away control of the documentation. And then they kind of like take it back, give it away, take it back. And that, that I've seen and it doesn't work as well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the control bit's really hard. I just actually had a conversation with that, uh, with, with somebody about that maybe an hour or two ago. 
they're they're concerned about giving up control of their project, but they they desperately need new maintainers. And it's it's a trade-off, right? It's it's hard and it's really hard for people. Like you said, it's kind of they look at it as their their baby. It's also an opportunity for uh, you know, somebody new in this world to sort of understand the level of diplomacy that's sometimes required to get things to move. Yeah, which is why I try to encourage maintainers to think of it as a management position. They need to delegate, they need to, they need to manage people, they need to be diplomatic and they do it. Um, and it's it's a different skill set than, you know, because a lot of maintainers ended up where they are because they write really, really good code. And it's it's not quite the same skill set. <laughs> One of the right. documentation challenges I've seen is that um, when people are writing new code, they may not be sure how it's supposed to work or how it actually does work. And so they're reluctant to write down the details until it, things have stabilized a bit. And if you have a level of chaos, not so to speak, in your coding, then it can be very difficult to document all the done. You may not want to document all the features. So very good. Thanks for all the discussion. This has been a really valuable meeting. All right. Thanks, everybody. Um, we'll see you again in two weeks. Think about what you want to talk about next week and feel free to, um, you know, drop those into the Slack channel or just add some space to add them here on the agenda for two weeks from now. Bye. All right. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Have a great week. Bye. Bye-bye.